is powerful enough to influence you, you even though it doesn't fit with what you see or what you feel as a statement to that fact. And that language, since it's in a way... Oh, is it not right? Yeah, it's a, oh, there it is. Sorry. Language in a way... Thank you. Since it is... Um, since it is the most evolutionary recent is also in some ways the part of our experience that we least understand. And while in a lot of the NL other NLP courses you learn how to change your visual submodalities and you learn sensory observational skills, which I think are incredibly important and that, uh, that are going to be an extremely useful and important tool to make sure that you balance your slide of mouth, using slide of mouth in and of itself will get you nowhere except into arguments. However, using language in addition with the other powerful tools that you have in terms of observing is going to be very important. And what we wanted to do is to identify some of the structure of how language worked, how it gets its power as its own reality, sort of saying that, that language doesn't have to be logical. It doesn't have to fit with what you see, and it can still be powerful. Um, the ways in which we explored that were how language can create meanings by creating categories. In my own personal experience, I remember a time when John Grinder, one of the early classes that I went to, you know, I was talking about how I walked into this class uh, 12 years ago. One of the assignments that he gave in the next class that I had with him was one that I, I will not forget. It was an assignment where he said, find something that you've never really paid much attention to before and name it. And notice how it changes your perception. Just make up a name for it. And notice how it changes your perception. And in going up and talking to him afterwards, I you know, was saying, well, what kind of things would you, you know, are you interested in? Or, you know, we're just kind of talking about it. At a certain point, my eyes shifted over and to the left. And he said, well, what about that? And I said, what? He said, your eyes just went over. Your eyes just moved. I said, mm -hmm. Tried to figure out, well, what was going on? And, um, I kind of felt that I'd gone inside, almost into a little trance state. So I kind of named it um, minimal cues, trance cues of how people put themselves, anchored themselves into a little bit of a trance. And began to go out and suddenly the most amazing thing happened. It was like scales fell from my eyes. And there I was sort of seeing this whole world in front of me that had always been there. I never noticed it until I gave it a name. And that information, incidentally, later developed into what is known as the NLP eye movements, NLP accessing cues. Back in those days, I was just noticing everything that people did, that snapped their fingers, tapped their head, clicked their tongues, blinked their eyes. It gave me a lot of wonderful things to do in classes where if I was getting bored, I could go and look at people and notice that somebody would be listening to the teacher. And you could see how big of a chunk of information they were taking in by their eye blinks. So the person would be sitting there and the guy would be talking, chunk, chunk, and the teacher would make a mistake or stumble upon a word and the person would go, Drrr, you know, <laughs> chunk, chunk. And you could actually uh, watch how much of a chunk of information a person was storing by how fast they blinked their eyes. Anyway, the whole world opened up to me. And I said, well, that's a pretty interesting thing. That's the power of modeling, the power of the word, the power of language. However, as we also know, that language can categorize things in ways that limit us, in ways that reduce our experience as opposed to enrich it and empower it. So what we've been exploring here is what are the ways? I, I like the fact that some of you said you could have permission to use these. Language is not the word in the sense of, you know, the, the, it's something that you have to respond to, that you can't speak back and have creative, and as Edmund said, both respectful as well as humorous, charming, and intelligent tools by which you can respond to things that people say that allow you to open up the belief not to make them wrong, nor to give in. And that's what meta is all about. And the kind of things that we explored were chains of meaning, chains of causes, and how causes can get set up with language. One of the things that many of the philosophers pointed out is that cause and effect is not really something that you can observe in the world. You notice that two things happen near each other, but cause and effect is a complete human construction. 
you really can't tell that something really caused something else. You can't observe it. All you can see is that two events happened in the same space and time, and cause is, is actually something that we put to it, which I think is a very powerful sort of way of thinking of what language can do. When I say this causes that, I've suddenly made a reality. We also talked about comparing. Comparisons to what? Rich compared to what? Um, we talked about the kind of levels of experience, that language can appeal to these different levels of being, whether it's specific behaviors, capabilities, identities. We've gone over some specific patterns for how to accomplish some of the kind of empowering changes or option opening changes. The fact that a number of you mentioned humor I think is good because humor is a state that occurs when suddenly you learn something. One of the, one of the most fascinating things I remember about watching Moshe Feldenkrais work was that he pointed out that when people really learn something, like if he, would, he was, I remember seeing a video where he was working with a child, this is an interesting thing about beliefs, who had um, cerebral palsy and his legs were being pulled together like, you know, they rubbed together and he couldn't walk very well. Three different surgeons had told the parents that the only way to deal with that, the only way for him to walk without damaging his legs would be to cut the adductor muscles on his legs which would then make them, of course, they would atrophy and become useless. So he would lose something. Within 20 mi minutes, Erickson had, uh, Erickson, <laughs> confusion of a, the same logical type, actually. Feldenkrais had this young man walking with his legs open, just by touching and moving and kind of doing a kinesthetic sleight of mouth, I would call it. And uh, one of the things that happened, there was a certain point when all of a sudden that child started laughing and you knew that he'd suddenly figured something out that he didn't know. And Feldenkrais said, that's right, you should laugh when you learn something important. That's the state that you want to attach to it. And I think in a way, humor and the whole idea of beliefs fitting in with humor and moving around there is something that's really important. So we learned some things about going to consequences, intentions, applying to self, metaframes, the various kinds of places that you can go to respond or frame a belief. Now, in doing this kind of work, uh, I have a little metaphor I'd like to kind of give you at the end of this program. I have a couple of, actually a couple of things I'd like to say, but first one is a metaphor about a young fellow who was learning drafting. And um, he went to study drafting and he, he had this very, I mean it was, drafting was something that was really important to him because he felt that drafting was was one of those things that was kind of a, an expression of what was really fully creative in people. For example, you took something that was a dream, a complete idea in, in somebody's mind, had no physical existence whatsoever, and you represented it. You made a map out of it. And from that map, somebody could actually take that and make and manifest that thing in the world. And I believe all map making functions are that way. So I, I'm, as an aside here, I believe that NLP, NLP is not a bunch of techniques for communication. NLP is tools for dreamers. NLP is tools that allow you to take things that are just conceptions and forge them into a map that allows you to manifest them physically in the world. That's what creativity and genius is all about, in my opinion. And this young fellow was able, you know, he got that and he really was, he had so many dreams that he wanted to manifest in terms of the kind of things that he saw in his mind. And so he went and he learned his class, he learned in his class, and he learned all about things like how important it was if you're going to build a house to have a good map. The map needed to represent things not only in the small details, but it needed to represent